I'd like to call to order the regular meeting on November 26, 2018. Please join Council Member Pazillo in the pledge and in the allegiance and following by the invocation. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Almighty Father, help us look to the past with gratitude and to the future with hope. Remember this day those who have come before us here, who labor not for themselves alone, but with a vision of building for us future, a world better than they had known. Inspire in us also a like vision that we too may labor for things beyond ourselves, that our lives may be dedicated to high purposes and grand horizons. Make us unafraid of hopes and dreams, Release us from cynicism and despair. Teach us to be realistic about our limitations, but never to lose hope in our potential to transcend them. Amen. 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 Thank you very much, Councilman Pazillo. All right, we need to excuse Councilmember Hampton. He will not be with us tonight. Could I have a motion and a second, please? Second. I heard a motion from Vice Mayor Campbell and a second from Councilman Kano. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. Let's go right to the communication. We have one item. Item 4.1, staff will present an overview of the home plate for the holidays event and Christmas in color event occurring in the, at the Goodyear ballpark. So please come forward. Jason, I have the right name. I have about three names down here. So Jason. <laughs> Uh, yep, Davenport Ballpark Operation Coordinator will be presenting. Jason. Good evening, Mayor, members of the council. I uh, just wanted to talk briefly this evening about a couple events that we have coming up. The first one is our Christmas in Color event, and this is the second year for this event. It returns to us for what we hope will become an annual tradition here for families of our community. Uh, this year's show actually landed at just under 1.2 million individual light bulbs. And so it's a really fantastic event. Um, for anyone who hasn't had a chance to see it, we highly recommend it. The show opens nightly at 6 p.m., and tickets are available both online and in person. So it can be a spur-of-the-moment decision as well. The next event that we've got coming up is one of our uh, city signature events. This is a, a favorite of ours. It's our home plate for the holiday event. Um, we've added some new components to this year's event. The first one is a 15-foot inflatable snow globe. And the concept behind this is that you and your friends, your family, whoever you'd like, can actually pile into this thing, and then you can take a picture, and then it looks like you're living inside of a snow globe. So it's kind of a cool feature. It's the first time we'll have had it. We're pretty excited for it. Um, and then we've also kind of um, bolstered up the kids and family activities at the event. Uh, one of the trends that um, people are seeing in the event business is they're trying to create activities and almost destinations inside of a larger event. And so what we've done with this area has added a couple new activities for kids to do, and I have props that I brought with me. Uh, the first is an ornament. So we'll have an opportunity for people to make their very own Christmas ornament at the event. Yeah, right? And then, oh, if that got a, well, then this one for sure. Look. <laughs> so this is a little stocking that people will be able to make, and they'll get the plain stocking like this, but then they'll have an opportunity to customize it. So we're going to have on-site screen printing where people can pick a design and a color and then have it made. And it's just kind of a cool experience where, you know, you, you get the music in the background, you have the snow, all the other cool aspects, the tree, of course, and then you have an activity that you can engage in while you're at the event. Um, we've got some great food and beverage options this year, everything from barbecue to tamales, um, even some special holiday dessert items this year. Uh, I learned last week that there's actually a product called uh, edible cookie dough, which first I wasn't sure I believed, but I did some research on it and found out that, yes, this is actually a thing. And we will have a uh, vendor on site, Karen's Creamery, who will be doing several flavors, holiday-themed flavors of edible cookie dough. Um, and then, of course, the uh, weather looks cool this Saturday, so we will have hot chocolate available as well, courtesy of his friends of the Goodyear Library. Um, so this year's tree, just a couple more notes about the event. This year's tree is an 18-foot Douglas fir from Eugene, Oregon. Uh, it was interesting. We were actually able to pick out the tree while it was still in the ground. The vendor that we use 
was sending us pictures of different trees. And then when we got to the one that we liked, we said, that's our tree, tag it. And so the tree actually arrived this afternoon at about three o'clock at the stadium, and we will be uh, decorating it over the course of the next two days. And so if anybody wants to um, stop by or just cruise by and see the event starting to come together, tomorrow or Wednesday would be a great opportunity to do that. And then lastly, um, all information about all of our events is, of course, available at our website, GoodyearBP.com. Um, and then the uh, obligatory plug for some spring training, right? So we've got a couple things happening with spring training. Uh, group tickets and season passes are on sale now, and mini plans go on sale this Friday, followed by single game tickets, which will go on sale December 10th. So with that, I will open it up for any questions. Questions? No, that was a great presentation. Okay. We're looking forward to all the new events. Um, I'm not sure this council's ready to for the cookie dough. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, we have until Saturday to get but ready for we're it. We're ready to get into the ball. Can we all fit in into it? Done. Easy. Absolutely. Uh, well, you're on. This council's <laughs> okay. going to be taking their pictures. <laughs> Fantastic. Okay? All right. Thank you. Thank you. Great presentation. All right, now is the time for citizens who would like to address the city council on any non-agenda item. Do we have any cards? No, Mayor. All right, then let's go on. We'll go down to the consent agenda. Would the city clerk please read, uh, the, excuse me, the next item agenda is approval of the consent agenda. Will the city clerk please read consent agenda item 6.1 through 6.5 by title only, please? 6.1, approval of minutes. 6.2, approve the budget transfers for fiscal year 2019. 6.3, approve the final plat for Crestwood at Canyon Trails. 6.4, rescind the final plat approval for Centera Corporate Center. 6.5, recommend approval to the Arizona Department of Liquor Licenses and Control of a Permanent Extension of Premises Patio Permit for Beach House Food and Spirits. Thank you. Are there any speaker cards? No, Mayor. Would, does council wish to remove any item from the consent agenda? Then can I have a motion and a second to appro approve the consent agenda? Second. second. Oh, I heard a, a motion from Vice Mayor Campbell and a second from was it, uh, Councilman Laura Tunnell. Roll call vote, please. Vice Mayor Campbell? Aye. Councilmember Pazillo? Aye. Councilmember Laura Tunnell? Aye. Councilmember Stitt? Aye. Councilmember Kano? Aye. Mayor Lord? Aye. The motion carries. All right, let's go to the business. I'd like to remind council to wait until there's a motion on the table to ask questions. We'll start at 7.1. First item is to conduct a public hearing to consider a use fit permit for an insisted living home. I'm opening the public meeting and Katie Wilkin, planning manager, is presenting. Thank you, Mayor, members of the council. As the mayor just stated, the request before you is to consider a use permit for an assisted living home or otherwise known as a group home for seven to 10 residents. The home is located at 4349 North 161st Avenue, which is in the Palm Valley phase five neighborhood. The home is currently operating as a group home for one to six residents. And I do wanna provide clarification to the public that despite no matter what the outcome of tonight's um, decision is, that home can continue as a group home for one to six residents. That is a use that is allowed outright. What we're discussing tonight is whether it can be increased to seven to 10 residents or not. Um, the reason this use permit is before the council is because there is an existing facility with seven to 10 residents located at 16195 West Glen Rosa um, that and so the proposed home does not meet the required separation distance. The city zoning ordinance um, defines a family as six or fewer unrelated persons living together. This is why a group home of six or fewer residents can operate anywhere in the city. Basically six resident, six people unrelated of any kind can live in a home. According to the Fair Housing Act, um, a group home is not to be treated as a business and employees of the group home don't count toward the number of residents. It's simply the residents living in the group home facility. And furthermore, cities cannot place restrictions on group homes 
that meet the definition of family that wouldn't exist for other homes, such as you can't limit parking for a group home if you don't limit parking for all single family homes in the neighborhood. So you have to be consistent. If someone wants to increase the number of residents to seven to 10 residents, they can do so as long as they're a quarter mile from other homes that have seven to 10 residents. And that is an administrative review that the separation distance is met. If they meet it, then staff has the authority to approve those applications. However, as highlighted yellow on the screen, if it doesn't meet the separation, um, for lack of a better word, a, a waiver or um, can be considered by the um, Planning Commission and City Council through the use permit process. The requirement is that it's a quarter mile or 1,320 feet from another home and the proposed house doesn't meet it by 175 feet. And I just wanna to state to the, the purpose of this separation is to avoid an over concentration of the larger group homes in a single neighborhood so that that neighborhood keeps its single family residential feel. And that's a benefit both to the residents of the group homes as well as anyone living in the neighborhood. And oh, so as I said, the proposed home does not meet the required separation distance of one quarter mile. And so use permits required. And the two bullet points on the screen are the evaluation criteria that the zoning ordinance spells out for use permits. The first being that we have to find that the a granting the use permit will not be material detrimental to persons residing in the area. And secondly, that the proposed use is reasonably compatible. Since May of this year, so approximately six months, there have been 22 calls for service to the police department and four calls to service to the fire department at this residence. Um, we don't have average numbers for fire, but the average single family home is about, um, is less than one call per year to the police department. So it is um, a much higher call for service um, to the police and fire departments at the home currently with one to six residents. There was a neighborhood meeting held on October 16th. There were three residents in attendance and they did express concerns with the use. And then the Planning and Zoning Commission heard this case at their meeting on November 14th. Two residents spoke in, operation, in opposition of the use permit. And then the Planning and Zoning Commission did recommend denial, um, citing that the calls for service are dis disproportionate to the calls for service of single family homes in the neighborhood and therefore it's not compatible and will be detrimental to persons residing in the area. Um, the Planning and Zoning Commission recommendation of denial was consistent with staff's recommendation of denial of the use permit. That concludes my presentation. I'm happy to take any questions. The applicant is here tonight and does have a presentation for you. Yes, and Katie, thank you. And would the applicant like to speak? Please state your name and address. Sure, my name is Crawford Breedlove. I'm the CEO of Arizona Behavioral Care Homes. My address is 2617 North 10th Street in Phoenix, Arizona. So I brought a, a presentation, but, and I was thinking when I set this up that what I would do is I would talk about the clients and the folks that we serve. Um, but I don't know if that'd be really an effective use of our time. Like uh, we provide residential treatment for uh, a population that's um, one of the most misunderstood villainized kind of marginalized population there is. Uh, we provide services for adult men and women who have serious mental illnesses. Um, there's a lot of misconception when it comes to, essentially when I tell people what we do, they just kind of visualize that we're opening up Shutter Island in neighborhoods around town. Um, and that I'm, I'm not here to advocate for clients today, even though I've spent a lot of time in my life doing so. Um, I'm here today to basically break down um, a few things of kind of what we're here for and what this is all about. So I made a mistake when I initially bought the house. Um, I knew that the quarter mile rule exists and I actually support the quarter mile rule. I don't think it's a good idea to inundate neighborhoods with group homes. I think that maintaining the feel of a single family neighborhood is important. Um, and I would have the expectation of, of any neighborhood to, to maintain that rule and do so. Um, 
we're a hundred and, and something feet short. Um, as you saw in the, in the map, the, the quarter mile line essentially cuts the house in half. And all of the, the feet that were short can be accounted for on the actual properties of the two homes. And so um, when it comes to the spirit of the rule, um, I don't believe that allowing us a use permit to operate with four more beds, four more clients, um, would violate the spirit of that that law. I don't I don't see the impact of the neighborhood just, you know, changing, you know, uh, as what the law was set up to avoid. Um, I think that um, we'll go past this. This is just some information about our clients. We 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 serve forty eight clients in Goodyear. Uh, we also employ forty people in Goodyear. Um, the growth that this would this would add uh, would it would make five new jobs available for folks living in Goodyear. Um, The denial that's being recommended is based on the rule that is materially detrimental. So the big, the big thing here is that there was 22 calls to the police over the last six months. And that sounds like a big deal. Um, just out of context, it is. A significant number of those calls were made by folks in the neighborhood and by a number of different neighbors. And the report is, is that when they see our clients out walking around the neighborhood and what, un, unsupervised, unaccompanied, that they call the police to report it. And our clients, uh, a number of them, not only are allowed to have alone time uh, and walk in a neighborhood just like anyone else that lives in a neighborhood, but some of them are in GED programs, community college programs, some of them are employed. Um, it, they have a, a myriad of different things going on with, with the clients that we serve. And so what the unfortunate part is that all of these calls, if they're made, they get thrown into the basket that belongs to us. And so if somebody inappropriately calls 911 to report a uh, an individual walking alone in the neighborhood, um, that, get, that gets assigned to us because that person lives at that, 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 that residence. Um, anytime that we call the police, because in that particular facility, we haven't had to call 911 for an emergency. We've called non-emergency police to report vulnerable members that are on court order treatment or vulnerable members that we think are vulnerable, like um, wouldn't be able to find their way home. And it's, it's, it's required to do so for this population if you believe that someone uh, is a danger to themselves or a danger uh, of being, you know, um, taken advantage of or something by someone else. Um, with with material, materially detrimental, it breaks down to being, subs like, to cause a substantial amount of harm. And I guess on, on my side, the frustrating part is that folks will call the police inappropriately on our clients just seeing them based on beliefs and, and whatnot, not rooted in any kind of, like in our company's history, we've had zero instances of a client engaging in any kind of violent or aggressive behavior with anyone that lives in the neighborhoods of any of our 10 facilities. And so there, there isn't any evidence to support this fear that drives folks to call the police and be terrified of the, of the folks that we serve, not actually based on anything they've actually seen or, or had happen. Uh, and that's frustrating because it also causes us, you know, consequences as well. Um, but what it boils down to um, is that the distance that we're short, if we were another 100 and something feet, we could, we could have obtained an occupancy license for 10 folks without any issue and we'd be fine and doing business. I made a mistake and we're 100 and something feet short. And what I'm asking is to not have to experience the financial loss to, to literally buy the home across the street from us that's available for sale and, and essentially move everyone across the street and all the furnishings and sell the house that we're in. Um, from a financial standpoint, in regards to being a financial burden or undue burden to the city, this is just a breakdown of just our operating and payroll costs um, for, for folks working Goodyear and in the city of Goodyear. So we inject about $1.5 million into the economy here in Goodyear, whether it's through payroll or through operating expense, any of those things. And that's just for these sites here in Goodyear. Now that's minus any ancillary costs or, or any of the other dollars affected. Like our, our line of service exists to save taxpayers money. We're a cost effective alternative to hospitalization um, and inpatient facilities that are in like in place to, that would be inappropriate for the folks that we serve. Um, and so <clears throat> the idea of creating a, uh, a financial undue hardship for the city of Goodyear uh, financially, it's just not there. 
Now, we can say that that's the case because of the number of phone calls, but when it comes to the number of phone calls, if you break down, if we did, let's say we did take ownership of all 22 calls as a facility. Let's say I, I'll take all the neighbor's calls, I'll take the clients calling on their cell phone, um, which we don't have a right to take from them. Um, we would still be able to cover about $69,000 per call. And so it would have to cost $69,001 per phone call to the police for us to start creating a financial hardship on the city. Um, and so all we're essentially asking for um, is to avoid having to incur what will be between eighty dollars to $100,000 um, in costs and the loss of selling another, like selling the home that we just put money into, you know, renovating and, and operate the business that we're operating now. Um, and, and the cost of, you know, buying that other home and moving across the street. Um, and so that's, that's, that's about it. Well, thank you very much for coming before us. I appreciate your time very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Is there anybody else in the audience who would like to speak? I have two speaker cards, Mayor. You have two? Okay. Would you please announce them? Barbara Gray. As you come forward, uh, you are limited to three minutes. The yellow light and the buzzer will let you know when you have 30 seconds left to speak. So before you start speak, uh, please identify yourself uh, by saying your name and your address, please. Thank you, City Council and committee members. My name is Barbara Gray. I uh, am a neighbor exactly across the street from this home. I never get involved in anything. I don't watch the news. I'm not into politics. So for me to be here is, must be something serious. Um, what Mr. Breedlove is indicating about the police calls, when you look at the actual report, you will see aggravated assault. You will see shouting, yelling, alcohol. A um, lot of yelling. Um, I've never called the police. My husband hasn't. We, we're in the cul-de-sac, which was a prime uh, a lot to have a home. And our neighbors, they do have their house for sale, and they've already dropped it close to 30000 just because of the house across the street. People are concerned. As far as these uh, gentlemen walking down the street to stretch their legs, um, there were seven police officers in the last seven days at that residence that I have pictures of in two fire trucks. I saw one gentleman detained in handcuffs and down the road where the um, mailboxes are, there was a, one of the residents had asked a little child for a cigarette. And so it's not that they're just walking around, they're approaching our children. And so I'm here. Um, so that old report of 22 incidents were called at that property is, is not current. Um, it has majorly impacted our neighborhood. Uh, I and my husband have lived there for nine years and nothing but peace, happy is going to be our forever home. If we could sell it today we, to get our money back, we would. But because of the appraisal value going down like it did, we're, we're stuck. Um, the, he, Mr. Breedlove stated that the van was always parked in the garage. It never is. Never it's there outside now. Um, there is a lot of parking of cars a uh, couple times a week, and it's in the cul-de-sac, and in front of my home, there are several, which again, I'm not one to cause any trouble, but I'm just letting you know that there is a parking issue. And um, now, hold on. So we pictured when we moved there that we would have just a beautiful upscale middle class neighborhood and have the peaceful time there and it has all changed. It has affected and impacted our neighborhood severely. The neighbors that are not here, I know it's low attendance, but they're afraid to come here. Um, we've seen it get worse in the last seven days, so we don't know what we're gonna go back to. But I think the spirit of the message and the request here is not so much as helping out people with men mental handicaps, but uh, money. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming forward. The next name, Mary Lou Facito.
Please state your name again and your address. Thank you. Um, I'm Mary Lou Pasalo, 4340 North 160 Press Avenue, Goodyear, Arizona. Thank you. We live in the neighborhood across the street from the assisted living. And what I said last time and how I, what I said and how I feel today is the same or even worse. We are concerned, very much concerned for our safety, um, security, and home value. Um, I know it was said in the last six months, 26 calls, police and firemen. People will not call somebody or cops will not come or no help will not be up if there's nothing going on. Uh, I heard that it's coming from the neighborhood. There's only about five in that cul-de-sac and I don't think one of us, I'm very sure not one of us. And then also, if a person, normal person, would call a police, there must be something. Why are you calling the police? So do we need to wait for something to happen before we do an action? So we are really very much concerned. And considering the two weeks span, I would think that we would be, or whoever is in this business would be a little bit careful now because two weeks, we have to make sure that everything is clean. But even with that two weeks, I'm hearing several police calls. So that means that it's really something. It used to be a nice community, quiet community. We are one of the uh, original owners of the house. In the past, we do um, community party, but I don't think that's doable anymore. We just have to look after ourselves. So, thank you. Thank you. All right, I'm gonna close the public hearing. And can I have a motion, a second, to deny the use permit for an assisted living home? Can I hear a motion? So moved. Second. I heard a motion from Council Member Pazello and a second from Council Member, Council Member Stiff. Open for Council discussion. Yes, Councilman Stiff. Katie. Sorry. We've had a lot of... <clears throat> Excuse me. A lot of discussion about the number of police calls to the location. How many fire calls were there again? Thank you, Mayor. Council Member Stitt, there were four calls for fire. And what was that time period? Um, it was from May of 2018. I'm not positive of the end date. Um, it was probably early November, so about six months. Thank you. I think the chief's coming up. Do Thank you. you. <laughs> Evening, Mayor and Council. Um, it was May 19th of 2018, and we actually, uh, Katie didn't know, but we've, we've had two calls in the last week at the address. So it goes through 11, 24, 28. And that, and that those two, is that So that actually eight? is six now. So from Katie's number of four, it's now six. Okay. And I had them look back an entire calendar year, so back to last one then. And there were none before May? Correct. So is that an unusual number to a single place? For a single address, yes. Residential address, yeah. So even if you take away all of the uh, discussion about whether, whether it was neighbors calling or people calling themselves, they didn't like what they had for dinner or whatever, the fire calls, I presume, are medical emergencies. They were, they were all medicals, yep. So... Those are those are different. Neighbors aren't calling because they saw something else. So um, I, I think that that, in a sense, kind of corroborates what the neighbors are saying about what's happening at, at that location. And at the end of the day, um, you know, we have these um, we have these rules in place about how far apart things can be and, and where they are. And they're not arbitrary. They're they're, they're hard lines. So um, I don't find a compelling reason to issue a special use permit um, for to increase the number of residents at this particular location. Um, our rules have not been hidden anywhere. They've been 
public. Mayor frequently says um, you should pay attention to what's going on around you before you buy anything. And, um, you know, it, I think before making an investment in a home that you intend to operate a care facility out of, you should know where the other ones are. And uh, I'm not inclined to support the special use agreement. Thank you for your answers, Chief. Yes, Councilman Lovatani. Uh, I have a, a question for the police chief about, um, I'll let the chief get up here. Um, do we know, first of all, I guess it's a two-part question. We heard from the neighbors that there was a recent activity there that aren't in that 22 calls. And then what is the nature of some of those calls? Um, I can give you some history on the calls for service. And going back, like we said, about six months, um, it looks like right about approximately 22 calls. And the most prevalent one appears to be missing persons where people have wandered away from the home and we've had to get dispatched out to go find. Um, there are also calls or a call of disturbances, welfare checks, threats, assaults, fight, suicide attempt, and a couple of calls related to drugs of some type. And you still have to, when you get the call, police have to respond, obviously. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? All right, I think it's time to vote for this. All in favor say aye. 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 Can we just do that a roll call? Because it was kind of choppy. The motion was to deny, is that correct? That's correct. Motion okay. was to deny. I did not vote. I was trying to grasp where we are, so. Okay, so Thanks. let's do the formal one, please. Vice Mayor Campbell? Aye. Councilmember Loretano? Aye. Councilmember Stitt? Aye. Councilmember Kano? Aye. Councilmember Pizzillo? Aye. Mayor Lord? Aye. The motion carries. Thank you. Let's go to 7.2 on the business. is a public hearing to consider a request to amend the Lucero Plan Area Development. Open the public hearing. Alex Plotinsky, Planner 2, will be presenting. Thank you, Mayor, members of Council. The Lucero neighborhood is in Estrella Mountain Ranch between Cotton Lane and Estrella Parkway near the Star Tower. This PAD amendment tonight only affects four parcels. That's 1A and 1B, which is in the north portion, um, and 5 and 10, which is in the uh, west side. Um, but overall, the entire PAD book is being restated to reflect the changes to those, two, those four parcels. In 2016, Council adopted the Lucero PAD amendment, which amended the development standards um, of those areas in red. Um, and all parcels were zoned to low and low medium dens density residential, except for parcels 11, which was zoned for medium density, and then 12, which was zoned for the commercial portion. So the purpose of this request, as I mentioned, is to restate the PAD and include two notes, numbers 19, or 18 and 19, um, to the development standard sheet, which is located on page 54 of the book. Note number 18 applies to parcels 5 and 10, which allows a front yard setback to be 10 feet to livable space. As the standards are currently written, all parcels have a front yard setback of 10 feet to side entry garages and front porches. Um, so with the proposed update, parcels five and 10 will have a front yard setback uh, of 10 feet to side entry garages, front porches, and livable space. And then note number 19 applies to parcels 1A and 1B. Um, the current side yard setback for all of the standard residential lots in Lucero is six feet. Um, so this request changes that side yard setback for parcels 1A and 1B um, to be reduced to five feet. For this PAD amendment, since it only made changes to areas that weren't surrounded by existing residential uh, or existing development, we did do an alternative citizen review um, and met all public notice requirements. No inquiries were received uh, regarding this project to date. Staff did not find any reason to deny the request since we've seen similar development standard updates recently, and this is only changing a small portion of the Lucero community. A couple of things to note. Um, parcels 1A and 1B are platted, but this does not affect the plats that are, have already been approved. 
um, staff does find the Lucero PAD meets the intent of the PAD zoning district. Um, and then the request does carry over all stipulations from the 2016 ordinance, except for one. And that stipulation deleted a provision within the PAD book. Um, but with this amendment, the provision was just deleted from the book itself, causing the stipulation to no longer be necessary. On November 14th, the Planning and Zoning Commission held a public hearing. Um, there was no one from the public to speak against the item, um, and the commission unanimously recommended approval. Um, as I mentioned, it does meet all of the city's general plan and zoning requirements. Um, therefore, staff recommends approval as well. Um, this concludes my presentation. The applicant is available if you have any questions for him, and I can answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. So the applicant does not need to speak. Is that what we're saying? If you'd like to. Thank you very much, Pete. All right. Are there any speaker cards? No, Mayor. All right. Then I'm going to close the public hearing. And will the city clerk please read resolution 2018-1930 by title only, please? Adopt resolution number 2018-1913 declaring as public records those certain documents filed with the city clerk entitled supplementary zoning map number 18-06A, Lucero legal description, and Lucero pad amendment October 2018. Thank you. Can I have a motion? A second to adopt resolution 2018-1913. Do I hear a motion? So moved. Second. I heard a motion from Vice Mayor Campbell, a second from Council Member Stiff. Open for council discussion. Have a yes, Vice Mayor. Um, I, I'm going to give it to you, Alex, but it may end up going to Pete. Um, for parcels 5 and 10, you're changing it from 18 feet to 10 feet. Is that to get a bigger house on the lots? Mayor, uh, Vice Mayor Campbell, uh, the, I can have Pete answer that question. The 18 feet, the current 18 feet setback that you're referring to is the 18 feet to the um, driveway. Right. And then um, the, their specific reasoning for the 10 feet to encroach um, on those two parcels is so they can have a casita or an extra get, guest bedroom That's a great idea. on the side. That's a great idea. Okay, thank you very much. Any other questions? Councilman Stiff? Just a comment, Pete. Um, it, it, you guys are ca constantly innovating uh, in, uh, in all of your property. And um, you're oftentimes on the forefront of, of what's going on in the community, uh, laying some pretty, pretty innovative groundwork for us on the residential side. So uh, just wanted to, in the spirit of Thanksgiving, tell you how much I appreciate that. Any other questions? No. All right, roll call vote, please. Vice Mayor Campbell? Aye. Council Member Stipp? Aye. Council Member Kano? Aye. Council Member Pizzillo? Aye. Council Member Loretano? Aye. Mayor Lord? Aye. The motion carries. All right, will the city clerk please read ordinance 2018-1430 by, by title only? Adopt ordinance number 2018-1413, conditionally rezoning the property within the Lucero final planned area development consisting of approximately 617 acres generally located on the west side of Estrella Parkway south of the Estrella Star Tower to the intersection of Estrella Parkway and Cotton Lane by adopting the Lucero final plat pad dated October 2018 which includes two new notes in the development standards affecting four parcels amending the zoning map of the city of Goodyear providing for non-abridgement providing for corrections providing for severability providing for an effective date and providing for penalties. Thank you. Can I have a motion, a second, to adopt Ordinance 2018-1413? So moved. Second. Uh, Councilman Loretano made the motion. I couldn't hear. Okay. Yeah. Councilman you. Kano made the motion, and he's and uh, you did the second. And Vice Mayor Campbell did the second. Open for council discussion. No discussion. Roll call vote, please. Vice Mayor Campbell. Aye. Council Member Kano. Aye. Councilmember Pizzillo? Aye. Councilmember Loretano? Aye. Councilmember Stipp? Aye. Mayor Lord? Aye. The motion carries. All right, let's go to 7.3 on business to connect, conduct a public hearing to consider the rezone of approximately 114 acres from the planned area development to light industrial. Open public hearing. Alex, you're on again. Thank you, Mayor. Four more. This property includes approximately 114 acres south of Camelback Road and west of Cotton Lane. So to the east, you can see Dick's Sporting Goods and REI and Sub-Zero. 
Um, to the west is the Abel Ranch community that we recently brought to you, um, and those are the uh, lots zoned agricultural urban. Um, the property is currently zoned I-1 light industrial with a PAD overlay under the Camelback 303 PAD. Um, this PAD also includes this portion in red um, that's designated for C2. However, this rezone does not include that C2 portion. Um, so should the rezone be approved, the red portion will be remain, um, remain zoned Camelback 303 PAD C2. So, um, so the area outlined in orange and in pink um, is being proposed for rezoning tonight. The general purpose of the PAD was to impose some restrictions in terms of design and development standards related to the property. Um, the area is designated industrial in the general plan and it is included in the loop noise contour. Um, so already the area is subject to certain federal restrictions. Um, so due to changing uh, the changing, excuse me, the changes within the city's design requirements, development standards, and the changing patterns of uh, industrial development, staff and the applicant found the PAD was no longer useful or beneficial. Uh, there are, however, some stipulations that staff has recommended in order to provide some additional protections to the future resi residential development to the west. So once again, since there wasn't much development surrounding the property, st staff did conduct an alternative citizen review. Um, property owners within 500 feet of the subject property were sent a postcard and advised to contact staff or the applicant with any questions or, com or comments. Um, and only one general inquiry was received, um, but they did not express opposition. The Planning and Zoning Commission heard the item on November 14th. There was no, no one in the public, from the public, um, who spoke for or against the item. Um, and staff has not received any opposition to date as well. That being said, uh, staff finds the rezone um, consistent with the general plan and the requirements of the zoning ordinance. Uh, Planning and Zoning Commission did recommend approval of the rezone on November 14th. This concludes my presentation. I can answer any questions and Ed Bull is here available for questions and a presentation for you as well. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any speaker cards? The applicant wants to speak. I would love to not speak. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know you'll stand by for questions, so there may be some. But thank you, for, thank you very much. All right. I'm going to close the public hearing. Will the city clerk please read the resolution 2018-1915 by title only? Adopt resolution number 2018-1915 declaring as public records those certain documents filed with the city clerk entitled Liberty Property Trust PV303 Exhibit A Legal Description and Supplementary Zoning Map number 18-09. Thank you. Can I have a motion a second to approve resolution 2018-1915? So moved. Second. I heard a motion by Councilmember Oratano and a, and a second by Councilman Pizzillo. Open for council discussion. Councilman Pazillo. Just a quick question for you, Ed. Is there a, a special project or something that maybe in the works is that's driving the uh, the zoning issue? Um, this is really going to sound like a lawyer answer because it's yes. Well, you're no. a lawyer, so I understand. Right. <laughs> you have to speak so up, please, into the microphone. We mic started point. this process long before there was a potential project that surfaced. Okay. Um, the application, um, we believe, makes a great deal of sense with or without a special project of which this land would be included if that goes forward. Um, but we started it before that special project began to be discussed. But there's potentially something in the pipeline? Potentially. Okay, thank you. Thanks for the question. House Member Schiff? Uh, well, did you have a question for I do, but you go ahead. You had, I called oh. you. Oh, okay. You. Sorry. Ed, this isn't for you. <laughs> this is a kind of a broader question um, that I should have asked earlier today. It's more for Rebecca, I think. If once we, um, this property is going to have access to Camelback, we've got uh, Camelback is becoming the way out 
on the north end for a number of these businesses. Um, and I know we're in the process of reviewing the CIP, Camelback, et cetera. Um, once we start approving these things and we start building on them, that becomes kind of accelerated. So is that, tell me that's on the radar for the upcoming. Um, the improvements to Camelback are always on our radar. But um, I, I do appreciate your question. However, the site plan or the three site plans that I see in the narrative actually don't have improvements up to Camelback, right. uh, but they do front, but you're, you are correct, the property is owned up to Camelback. So we would certainly be looking at opportunities there along with all of the other projects in this vicinity that have come in. So yes, understanding this project has no impact on it. However, looking forward, mm -hmm. because it takes us two years to get to that point, um, I, I guess it would be my hope, unrelated to this, that we start looking at Camelback as a, as a place for us to start making some roadway improvements well before there's a high demand for them. Because Camelback right now is a two-lane, mm -hmm. no curbed. I mean, I'm not telling you something you don't know, but um, I hope and hope the rest of the council looks at that and says, yeah, we need to get Camel back on the radar sooner rather than later. Um, because Indian School, with as much residential traffic or as much resident residential property that backs up to it, Camel back, we can get ahead of the curve instead of doing it the other way around. So thank you for thank filling you. that in. Vice Mayor? Chair Jennifer Scott. Okay. Any other questions? Then could I have a roll call, please? Vice Mayor Campbell? Aye. Council Member Pizzillo? Aye. Council Member Loretano? Aye. Council Member Stitt? Aye. Council Member Kano? Aye. Mayor Lord? Aye. Motion carries. Will the City Clerk please read Ordinance 2018-1450 by title only? Adopt Ordinance Number 2018-1450, conditionally rezoning approximately 114 acres located south of the southwest corner of Camelback Road and Cotton Lane to I-1 Light Industrial. Amending the zoning map of the City of Goodyear, providing for non-abridgement, providing for corrections, providing for severability, providing for an effective date, and providing for penalties. Thank you. Can I have a motion, a second, to adopt Ordinance 2018-1415? So moved. Second. I heard a motion from Vice Mayor Campbell and a second by Councilman Kano. Mm -hmm. Open for council discussion. No discussion. Roll we'll call vote, please. Vice Mayor Campbell? Aye. Council Member Loretano? Aye. Council Member Stitt? Aye. Council Member Kano? Aye. Council Member Pizzillo? Aye. Mayor Lord? Aye. The motion carries. Let's go to 7.4 on business to uh, is to approve the request for the preliminary plat for La Privada subject to stipulation. Alex, you're, you're busy this evening, aren't you? <laughs> Thank you, Mayor. This project might sound familiar. The council approved the rezoning of the property last month for La Privada. The preliminary plat for the property includes approximately 198 acres and subdivides, uh, proposes 602 single family lots north and east of the Perryville Road and Yuma Road intersection. Um, as I mentioned, we just rezoned the property to R14, R16, and R17. Um, so we eliminated the PAD on that property and uh, stuck with the city zoning district. This is a screenshot of the preliminary plat that was included in your packets um, showing the proposed subdivision. Since the R14 district was utilized, as we discussed with the rezoning, there are some additional requirements. Um, with the preliminary, preliminary plat, we do verify that all those minimum requirements are being satisfied. Um, so they have the detached sidewalks and pavers and um, trails and open space amenities that we did identify with the rezoning. Um, as well as uh, oh, yeah, all of the amenities as mentioned previously. Therefore, staff found, or found that the preliminary plat did meet all engineering codes and then the codes of, uh, that rezone the property and recommended approval. The Planning and Zoning Commission did review the item on November 14th and um, unanimously recommended approval as well. This concludes my presentation and the applicant is also available for a presentation or any questions if you have any. Thank you. So, uh, would the applicant like to speak? All right. Are there any speaker cards? No, Mayor. All right. Would it, Would anybody in the audience like to speak? All right. Let's have a motion, a second, to approve the preliminary plat for La Provada with stipulations. Do I have a motion? So moved. I have a motion from Council Member. Second. 
Dip? Second. And a second from, from Vice Mayor Campbell. Open for council discussion. All right, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, the ayes have it. Let's go to 7.5 on business to approve a request for the preliminary plat for Palm Valley Crossing, subject to stipulation. Alex? Two more. <laughs> so this is the preliminary plat for Palm Valley Crossing. It consists of seven acres um, located at Auto Drive and 137th Avenue. Um, the two areas included in the preliminary plat are north and south of Auto Drive. Um, and then, so just for reference, we have Litchfield Auto Repair and Elevate Trampoline Park to the north. Um, to the south, uh, cut off from the screen is Van Buren, and then you have Central Marketplace, which has the 99 cent store um, and some of the other shops um, just to the southeast of the property. The property is currently zoned under PAD, or the Palm Valley Crossing PAD. It's designated, it's these two parcels right here, um, designated for auto-related, right there, auto-related commercial and service commercial, um, which allows for various commercial and light industrial uses. The preliminary plat proposes this property be subdivided into six lots, um, and in total, there's three buildings planned. Um, so each building was, will sit across two lots. There will be shared access granted throughout the site. Um, this layout allows smaller tenants opportunity to own their own, own, own their own building um, and operate their smaller business uh, within those uh, buildings. The preliminary plat meets all requirements um, for planning and engineering uh, and staff recommends approval. The Planning and Zoning Commission did recommend approval of the preliminary plat on November 14th as well. This concludes my presentation. I believe the owner is here um, if you have any questions. Would you like to speak or? No, all right. Thank you very much. Okay, are there any other speaker cards? No, Mayor. All right. Then I'd like a motion and second to approve the preliminary plat for Palm Valley Crossings with stipulations. Are there a motion? So moved. Second. second. I heard a motion from Vice Mayor Campbell and second from Councilman Pazillo. Open for council discussion. No discussion, all right. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, the ayes have it, congratulations. All right, next item, 7.6 on business is to approve a request for a preliminary plat for Hudson Commons Parcel 2, subject to stipulation. Of course, Alec Latinsky, Planner 2 is up again. All right, let's wrap this up. The property is located at the, or south of Van Buren, just west of Estrella Parkway. Um, you recently approved the Culver's drive through adjacent to this area. To the west is Wildflower Ranch, and to the north is Bella Rosa at Canyon Trails, which is currently under development. Um, to the south is the city's future recreation campus. The subject property is approximately 66 acres and includes 250 single-family lots. The property is zoned PAD under the Hudson Commons PAD and designated for single-family residential. Um, the northeast portion was designated for the commercial um, where the Culver's is planned. The southeast portion is designated for multifamily, which uh, will be like a single-story single, single multifamily like Christopher Todd or the Avila product. The PAD was one of the first 50-foot uh, wide lot requests that the city accepted with additional enhancements required. So those, in, uh, those included detached sidewalks, um, with trees, pavers, um, additional pedestrian connectivity, and so on. The applicant had demonstrated that all of those requirements were being met, along with all other city codes and ordinances. Um, therefore, staff recommends approval. The commission also recommended approval on November 14th. This concludes my presentation. I have not seen the applicant, but they might be here. <laughs> Thank you. Are there any of the speaker cards? No, Mayor. All right. I'd like a motion and second to approve the preliminary plat for Hudson Commons Parcel 2 with stipulation. Motion? So moved. I second. Heard a motion from Council Member Kano and a second from Councilman Stipp. Open for Council discussion. I got a quick question, please. Yes, Vice Mayor. Um, Alex, on just looking at the map in it, this map, is the only entrance in this into this property going to be on 158 or Will West Harrison be um, a, one of the exits? Um, thank you. The, the main entry is off 
where you can see the Sentara Drive alignment, and that turns into Hudson Road or Way. Yeah. Um, and then they'll have two additional entries off 168th. 158th, 158th. But we'll have no entrance or exits on Harrison, which would back up to our recreation campus. Correct. No egg entrance or exits off Harrison. Okay, good. Thanks. Any other questions? All right, let's vote for it. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. All right, we're at the end. Thank you, Council. Uh, any information items you'd like to share with us? Yes, Council Member Stipp. A couple of meetings ago, you said, hey, bring the good news forward. So I'm bringing the good news okay, forward. Okay, all right. Um, uh, two weeks ago, 10 days ago, uh, economic development staff made a presentation somewhere in Pebble Creek. Um, yes, at my Rotary. At Rotary, but I think there was another one to the lifelong learners, right. mm -hmm. uh, something like that. Um, one of those two or both of them combined, uh, at least in the, and I don't live there anymore, but at least in the network that I uh, that I have, were very well received, and uh, uh, I think you're going to see a request come forward for another presentation to a much larger group. And I don't know if you guys have heard since you live there, um, but it was uh, it was very well received. Um, it it answered a lot of questions for for people in those two groups, and uh, the positive energy that came out of that has been pretty good. So I. Um, would encourage, uh, and uh, Julie and I talked about it today in one-on-one, -on -one, if, if that request comes, we should probably get on it sooner rather than later. It was very well received, and, and uh, before you guys lose your mojo on the presentation. <laughs> but it was, it was really good, so um, I wanted to give you know, thanks to the ED staff for, for making that happen. Great. Yes, Councilman. You know, I just want to piggyback on there. I was there for the um, Pebble Creek Rotary presentation, and... Uh, it actually went longer than expected because they kept asking questions and the energy was high. And I would just say to the city manager, um, you need to get her out more often because she does an excellent job at presenting the city and what's going on um, in economic development. So kudos, you did a great job there. Any other comments? All right, city manager, it's over to you. Nothing. Well, I think everybody had a great Thanksgiving. It's nice to have everybody back. I know we have one missing tonight, but um, so this is kind of the beginning of the holiday season. So I'm wishing you all well. The next meeting will be a work session, December 3rd, 2018 at 430, followed by a regular meeting at six. And then, so we're looking at December 17th after that for a work session and a regular meeting. No further business, this meeting's adjourned. <laughs>